Hi guys, um, my name is Sharad Patel. I am an intensivist at Cooper with interest in echocardiography, diastology, and the works. And um, I'm going to be doing a talk, a brief talk on diastology in the ICU. All right, so most of the slides, the graphics, the images, it comes from this um, guideline paper uh, for diastology. Easy to find if you just type in Sharif Nagwa, and um, uh, you'll find the ASC guidelines for diastology, and you'll, there's a lot of useful information in there. So when I'm thinking about diastology in the ICU, we understand systolic function. We talk about it all the time. But when I'm trying to figure out what is the utility of understanding someone's diastolic function, I'm thinking about is there an impairment number one is there an impairment in relaxation is there an impairment in relaxation and if it's impaired I'm trying to figure out if you have impaired relaxation is the filling pressure elevator now now that's the key right so if you have impaired relaxation and you have normal filling pressures it may not be as useful to you in settings where you're trying to figure out why someone's hypoxic and they have pulmonary edema, right? So if they have normal filling pressures that and you have pulmonary edema, for example, that may be a situation where you have non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So I take that back. It's helpful, um, but it gives you different information. So uh, is there impaired relaxation that tells you that someone has diastolic dysfunction and then you're trying to figure out if they have normal left atrial filling pressures or elevated left atrial filling pressures? So these are the diastology guidelines. It looks complicated, um, but don't worry. I know it looks confusing, So, but we're going to try to focus on a few things that are useful to us as intensivists rather than what would be useful to a cardiologist. So again, let's go back to the question of is there diastolic dysfunction? So I like to, when I'm thinking about diagnostics, I try to think in terms of Bayesian reasoning. So I try to think, I'm looking at this patient, what is my, before I do anything else, what is my pretest probability that this person has impaired relaxation? And again, I'm assuming I have a clinical question in mind, uh, whether it's shock or it's hypoxia and pulmonary edema. So if I'm going through my pretest, my Bayesian reasoning, I have my pretest probability, I have new evidence, and then I have a post-test probability. And so the new evidence is basically telling me, uh, based on this evidence, does my pretest increase or decrease, uh, or my post-test increase or decrease? So, for example, let's say in all the population, there is a 15% incidence of diastolic dysfunction. Again, I'm just throwing that number out there for just an example. If you have someone who's 80 years old, the likelihood ratio or the, the evidence of them being 80 years old would increase your likely your post-test probability of high diastolic dysfunction very high. Most 80-year-olds will probably have impaired relaxation and diastolic dysfunction. So that would make your pre-test probability your post-test probability go up significantly. Then you add hypertension, end-stage renal disease, diabetes. You go through the same process each time coming up with a new post-test probability. If you have 80-year-old with all three comorbidities, you probably have close to 100% post-test probability of, of diastolic dysfunction. So that helps you as you're going through, as you see findings, you're saying, okay, this is within the context of someone who has impaired relaxation. You go to 2D imaging, if someone has LVH, large left atrium, again, your likelihood ratio will be high and your pretest will jump up to a high post-test probability. And then to get more of the nuanced approach of whether there's diastolic dysfunction, you get to the Doppler. But by the time you get to Doppler, you should have a understanding of that this person has a high pretest or not. So let's take this example right here. So I have a 75-year-old 75 75-year-old 75 patient with end-stage renal disease, hypertension, and diabetes. Let's watch this video. Now, you look at this video, and it's a short clip, but you immediately recognize. So it's a subcostal image. You have your right ventricle, right atrium, left ventricle, left atrium. 
you immediately notice how generous and large these atria are, right? So they're very large. Now, just by that self, uh, you know, for the diastology criteria, left atrial volume index is one of the criteria, which I'm not going to focus on. But for us, it's going to be more qualitative. Does there significantly enlarge atria or not? Here, the atria are very large compared to the overall left ventricular, right ventricular um, sizes and volumes. So immediately, I think this person has a very high pretest probability of diastolic dysfunction. Already beyond the fact that I have a 75-year-old end-stage renal hypertension diabetes, my pretest, even before I look at anything else, probably close to 100%. Then I add the large left atria, and then I'm finally looking at the, look at how thick these left ventricle and right ventricle are, right? So this person, I would probably be thinking this person has like amyloidosis or something. And that's probably why they have this degree of pathologic findings. But this case right here, even before I look at any Doppler, is going to have a likely 100% probability, post-test probability of diastolic dysfunction. Now, let's try to keep it simple. So this is kind of my approach to diastolic dysfunction. First of all, I ask myself, what is the question? Is this, why is my patient in shock? If that's the question, I'm going down a, a certain type of reasoning. And again, what, why is my patient? Uh, the other question might be, why is my patient hypoxic? And again, you may have both of these things, but both of these things can be assessed using diastolic dysfunction um, as a pathologic finding that may be contributing to it, right? So I have my question, and then I'm looking to see, is my EF normal or abnormal? Now, remember, ejection fraction is not the end all. You can have a high ejection fraction and a low cardiac output. So remember, people with a high ejection fraction doesn't necessarily mean that they have a normal cardiac output. For example, if you uh, so you, if, for example, if you have someone who has, because the stroke volume is what's basically going to tell you whether you have a high cardiac output or high uh, inotropic activity or not. So your ejection fraction is the ratio of your end, uh, your stroke volume divided by your end diastolic volume. Now, if you have a small end diastolic volume, you're at any given stroke volume, you're going to have a high ejection fraction. But if your stroke volume is low in the end, your stroke volume is low. So your cardiac output is also likely to be low at any given heart rate. So ejection fraction is not the end all. But for me, when I'm thinking about diastolic dysfunction, it, I go down different paths depending on whether if the ejection fraction is normal or abnormal. So if you have abnormal diastolic, uh, uh, abnormal ejection fraction, or if you have systolic dysfunction, you 100% have diastolic dysfunction present. You cannot have systolic dysfunction without diastolic dysfunction. Now, the converse is not true. If you have normal ejection fraction, again, we know this, you don't necessarily have normal diastolic dysfunction. This is where it gets a little bit more complicated. This is where you use the ASE algorithm to try to figure out, does this person have impaired relaxation or not? Again, remember to go back to your Bayesian reasoning, the age, comorbidities, and that'll help you figure out if someone has impaired relaxation. Now, if you're trying to figure out by Doppler, if someone has impaired relaxation, let's say it's more of a subtle case. It's a 50-year-old with only hypertension and not major LVH. And you're trying to figure out if someone has impaired relaxation. The first thing I like to do is actually tissue Doppler. Now, I'm assuming we've already had a Doppler talk. But again, the tissue Doppler is essentially just measuring the velocity of the tissue moving up and down. And if this value is low, uh, the cutoff being 8, if it's less than 8 at the medial um, mitral annulus, uh, you are likely have impaired relaxation, your E prime. If it's less than 8, you're likely impaired relaxation. That, so that's already answered your question. And then you're just trying to figure out if someone has high filling pressures or that, which we'll talk about. After that, if I have impaired relaxation, I'm trying to grade the diastolic dysfunction. I'm not grading it just to grade it, but this actually figures out, helps me figure out if someone has normal or abnormal filling pressures or not. And then finally, I try to integrate with lung ultrasound. So oftentimes in hypoxia, there's pulmonary edema. I'm trying to figure out if the pulmonary edema is cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic, and diastology will help me figure that out. So if someone has normal LVF, again, this is the more complicated one because systolic dysfunction always has diastolic dysfunction. I'm looking at these parameters. Now, this is from the AIC guidelines. 
I will show you a little bit more simplified versions of this, but the ASC guidelines say an average EDE prime, which we'll talk about, but um, the septal E prime velocity, which I just talked about, less than seven. Now, uh, eight is what was thrown out by Dr. Paul Mayo in a, in a critical care diastology paper. Uh, you can use eight or you can seven, but uh, as intensivists, we're trying to look for extreme examples. So um, uh, if it's less than eight, I would be concerned for impaired relaxation. Now, the TR velocity probably tells you a little bit about chronicity. Um, and then just is this diastology impressive enough and significant enough to cause pulmonary hypertension? So the TR velocity greater than 2.8 millimeters per second. And then, again, this is probably the biggest case for chronicity is left atrial volume index. It's greater than 34. You know this diastolic dysfunction has been going on for a long time. Now, if you have greater than 50% of these positive, then you have diastolic dysfunction. If you have 50% positive, you're indeterminate, then you can do more advanced studies to look for. But um, we, uh, this is kind of the ASC guidelines, and I'll show you kind of like more of a simplified approach. So this is the tissue Doppler, so TDI I was talking about. So you have your four chamber view. I am putting my tissue Doppler gate here at the medial annulus of the mitral valve and I'm measuring how fast it's going up and down so how fast the tissue is moving up and down so if you go through this this is your E prime this is your A prime again it's analogous to your diastolic dis uh, diastolic uh, mitral and M mode uh, motions as well right so you can find that this is your QRS so this is your systole will happen. This is your S prime. So basically your systolic movement of the mitral annulus. And then around where the T wave starts, you'll have diastolic, your diastolic phase. So E prime, A prime. So these are the values you're going to be measuring. This is the measurement you would make to figure out uh, for impaired relaxation. This value is 11.5. So you would assume that this person likely has a normal relaxation pattern, therefore no diastolic dysfunction. The mitral... Doppler pattern. So this is blood velocity. And so we'll we'll talk a little bit about this going forward, but these are the basic patterns. So your normal mitral pattern is your you have an E wave, but basically your as your filling pressures in your left atrium rise, um, your as the left atrial pressure goes beyond the left ventricular pressure, because you remember and during diastolic, uh, during diastolic phase, your left ventricle is relaxing, your left atrium is filling, and as the pressure in your left atrium rises above your left ventricle, your mitral valve opens, and this blood velocity representation is what you get as your mitral valve initially opens your E-wave. Your initial blood output goes back to base uh, to baseline, and this is called diastasis before your A-wave, and then you finally have your atrial kick. If there was an EKG here, your P-wave would be around right here. Right? So this is a normal pattern. Your E is greater than your A. Now, your E, in type 1 diastolic dysfunction, your E is smaller than your A. And we'll go through the physiology of why this is occurring. But this is type 1, type 2, type 3, and then your type 3 has kind of like a restrictive versus a fixed restrictive, which we'll talk about. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the physiology again. So if you are looking at an E and an A, so again, this is a normal pattern. Your systolic, so this is volume, and so your, if this is LV volume, and uh, so as your LV volume has reduced down, as a, a LV is ejecting and systole finishes, your LV volume is filling up again as your beginning of diastole, right? So your LV volume really jumps up as the mitral valve opens. So again, left atrial pressure goes higher than your left ventricular pressure, your mitral valve opens, and then your left ventricular volume fills up. So your E wave is your initial passive filling. And so you get your and rise in the left ventricular volume and your E wave represents this. Finally, you get diastasis and then your atrial kick at the end. And this is where you fill up your final left ventricular volume. Your mitral valve closes at that point. If you're looking at pressure, so if you have left ventricular pressure and left atrial pressure on one and you have your EKG, um, so again, I am looking at my left ventricular pressure. So 
This is during diastole again. So my LV is relaxing, relaxing, relaxing. And so, and my left atrium at the same time is filling. So the pressure in the left atrium is rising. So as the left atrial pressure goes above my left ventricular pressure as the left ventricle relaxes, your mitral valve will open up. And then you're at that point as the mitral is opening, filling will happening. So the left atrium ejects, left atrial pressure drops, left ventricular, left ventricle is filling, left ventricular pressure is rising. And so now your mitral valve will eventually close as the pressure overall, um, uh, as your left ventricular pressure will rise significantly above your mitral valve, right? And so if you're looking at your EKG, around the T wave is around where the beginning of diastole happens. Your atrial kick will happen after your P wave. And after your QRS, this is where systole is going to happen. Uh, this is your isovolemic relaxation time. So how fast this relaxation happens and how efficiently is a kind of a measure of your relaxation. If this is happening slow and sluggish, you have an elevated or longer isovolemic relaxation time, and that's an indication of diastolic dysfunction. And so uh, this gradient is what makes the E wave happen. So the bigger this gradient is, the bigger this E wave, the smaller this gradient is between your left atrium and your left ventricle, the smaller this E wave is. So as impaired relaxation occurs, this drop down to left ventricular pressure might be lower. So it may stop right here and you see the gradient might be smaller. Your E wave will get smaller and your A wave will get bigger, right? So this is kind of how your E and your A happen. So diastolic dysfunction, again, you have your E and your A wave. So as your what is happening when you compare pressure and volume curve is when you have, if this is your normal um, uh, cardiac function curve, so as the volume is increasing, your pressure is rising. At any given volume, when you have a impaired, relaxed left ventricle or stiff left ventricle, this curve will shift up. So at any given volume, your pressure will be higher. So it's all reduced compliance. And so this is how we look on a pressure volume curve. So this slide is important. So again, but let's come back to this in a second. So I mentioned before, as your left ventricular relaxation becomes less efficient, it's it's uh, the term for this is called negative DPDT. So the negative change in pressure over time. So if you would imagine a impaired relaxation LV or less efficient LV as far as relaxing would relax slower than its alternative. So this takes a little bit longer. Your IVRT, isovolemic relaxation time is longer. And then your peak negative pressure is lower or is higher as well with the left ventricle because it's not as efficient. This delta will be smaller and your E wave will be smaller. So that's the physiology of why your E wave is smaller than your A wave. In this situation, your delta being smaller, E wave smaller, your atrial kick has to make up for that. So the atrial kick component of left atrial volume reduction is going to be larger and therefore you have E smaller than your A. So this is stage one diastolic dysfunction. Now, the most of the phases of diastology, except the most the not the restrictive uh, unch. So if you go back to the slide before, so this phase fixed restrictive, all these are modifiable. And if you change your volume patterns, typically you can change how this looks at at any given point. So any given diastolic function, if you give them more preload, this can change. So let's say you started off at uh, this A point right here. Your A, E is bigger than your A, um, and there's probably impaired relaxation. Um, if I did a tissue Doppler on this person, their tissue Doppler is probably low. Now, if I give this person eight liters of fluid, I can go from here to here to here. And so this is what the picture will look like. And you can see, as I'm going up, my E to A ratio is changing. So here, my E is this big, my A is this small, and the ratio is much greater than two. And so that will tell me that my filling pressure, my left atrial filling pressures are larger. And this person probably will end up having pulmonary edema from elevated left atrial filling pressures. But if this, conversely, if I have this, I could probably diurese them and bring them down to here. Right? So you can actually follow this over time and you'll see a difference in it. So as I'm changing this, you'll see that the gradients are changing. So if this is, again, my left ventricular pressure, um, this is my peak negative right here. 
If I gave someone a lot of volume, I could move from here to here. You can see this gradient's bigger, and that's why my E wave is bigger. I can bring them down. I can diuresis, diuresis, diuresis. I can bring them down to down here as well. And so in someone with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you can see this difference as over time. If you have someone who was on dialysis and you UF them four liters and they were up here before you, if you do, if you repeat that test, you'll probably see them that they'll come down to here. This is an example of a mitral pattern of post-wave Doppler. And so this is your left ventricle. This is your mitral valve. And so basically it's just a um, right above a centimeter above the mitral valve. And you're, again, you have your E wave, and then you have your A wave. So this is a normal looking pattern. So let's do a case. So you have a 65 year old male with a history of heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, history EFs 25%, end stage renal disease, hypertension, found to be hypotensive. Had HD earlier in the day, but unclear whether he received UF or not. Um, you are called for a rapid response. And you're trying to figure out why this person's hypotensive. So let's assume the patient's awake, maintaining you have time to do these things. So you calculate the patient's cardiac output. It's low. It's 2.3 liters. You do a Doppler pattern evaluation, and you get this. So you remember, so if you go down to your diastolic dysfunction evaluations, um, I have someone who's older, I have someone with end-stage renal, someone's hypertension. So let's say I didn't know anything about the ejection infection. Their pretest for having diastolic dysfunction is very, very high. So if I just saw this, I would probably assume that the person probably has elevated filling pressure, even if I knew nothing else except that history. Now, if I look at the ejection infection at 25%, I know that person has a diastolic dysfunction for sure. If you have systolic dysfunction, you have diastolic dysfunction. So I have someone with impaired relaxation, a reduced EF, and then I'm looking at this Doppler pattern. So again, my E and my A, my E to A ratio is greater than two. So why is that significant? So I'm looking at the E velocity is 151. And so I can tell you that's elevated. Normal is 50 to 80. But again, the number by itself doesn't mean much. So let's see going forward. So what is the diagnosis and the next best step? So if I'm going through this and I'm just taking a test or I'm actually doing this clinically, I'm trying to figure out which of these are, is the likely diagnosis. Now, he went to dialysis. I don't know if he received ultrafiltration or not. So I'm still trying to figure some of this stuff out. Now, based on that E to A greater than 2, I have an EF that's low. I have a dialysis patient. The pretest that this person's hypovolemic or dry, and their left atrial filling pressures are low, it's going to be low. Because I see this E to A pattern. It's greater than 2. E is really high. I haven't given you much else information. I know my E prime is going to be low because systolic dysfunction, pretest, uh, for impaired relaxation is high. So I know my 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 EDE prime, which I'll talk a little bit about in a little bit, a ratio, which is an indicator of, of uh, elevated wedge pressures, is going to be high. I know by E and A ratio by itself, it's greater than two. And someone with systolic dysfunction, that's a measure, that person probably has left, elevated left atrial filling pressure. So I have elevated likely left atrial filling pressures. So A, I think, is lower likelihood. And if I gave them more fluids, I may worsen the picture. Uh, septic shock, it could be septic shock. I mean, but uh, if this is an acute change um, and I didn't give you any history about fevers or anything like that, uh, and if you were taking a test and you were asking the nurse if they're fever, you're asking other questions, if there's no other indicators of that, my pretest for this is a little bit lower compared to my next one, which is cardiogenic shock. I have someone who has a calculated low cardiac output. Now, in septic shock, by itself, if you had a relatively preserved cardiac function before, your cardiac output will be normal to high usually. But again, that's a overly simplistic example, which in real life, it may not be built on a test. A, you'll probably get a higher cardiac output unless they have an additional septic cardiomyopathy. Um, so I have high left atrial filling pressures likely. I have a low cardiac output. C has moved up very high on my differential, right? So I have a 65-year-old with end-stage renal disease, um, for sure impaired relaxation, likely high filling pressures and a low cardiac output. Sounds like cardiogenic shock, right? So this is kind of what I'm going to be going with at that point. So I'd probably start ionotropes and ultrafiltration, and have ultrafiltration maybe with CRT at that point. He has obstructive shock from PE. I have no evidence that this for this at all. An interesting thing is that when you have PE often by itself and there's no other additional left ventricular pathology, 
the electors see a reversal on this. Your E will be small and your A is low. And again, if you did an elevated ED prime evaluation and calculated estimated filling pressures, they'll be low because obstruction prevents filling pressures into the left atrium. Uh, so it'll be low left atrial filling pressures. And uh, you may look like hypovolemic if you didn't look at the RV as well. So this is unlikely as well, both on history and also the filling patterns. So the answer is likely C. So what stage uh, and left atrial filling pressure do we have? So we know in stage one, I showed earlier, uh, the E is smaller than A. So it can't be that. Um, I do have elevated filling pressures. Um, uh, the E is greater than A. So it's either going to be two or three, right? Stage two or three. Stage two or three or the, the theoretical four with, where the filling pressures don't really change much in the the morphology doesn't change even with diuresis. So two to three is kind of what I'm trying to figure out. So it could be two, it could be three. But my left, my E to A ratio is greater than two. Um, so if that's the case, typically you'll have, you're more likely to be in stage three, so more advanced setting. Your left atrial filling is pressures up really high. I already said stage two is typically elevated left atrial pressure. So again, if you were taking a test, this would be wrong. It'd be elevated left atrial filling pressures. Uh, so I'd already be crossing one and two out. But le typically, uh, E to A greater than two, it would be stage three, and you'll have elevated left atrial filling pressures. So again, so we're going down to the mitral. Um, so we did initially a normal ejection fraction. So if we're looking at mitral inflow patterns, if you have reduced systolic function, I don't have it on here, if you have an E to A greater than 2, you have guaranteed elevated left atrial filling pressures, right? So this is assuming you have diastolic uh, um, diastolic dysfunction already. You have a diagnosis of diastolic either through systolic dysfunction, you know have you know you have diastolic dysfunction, or you have normal EF, you've already surmised that this person has impaired relaxation. This is the phase, this is the methods you can go through to try to figure out if someone has elevated left atrial filling pressure. So in our case, E day is greater than two, you're already done, so it's simple, right? Otherwise, you'd have to go through a little bit more complicated pattern right here. All right, well, what about this? So let's take the exact same case, but my E is much smaller, 45 compared to 150 before. My E is smaller than my A. Now, if I was going through the same reasoning, again, this is simplistic. Uh, it's a reductionist kind of approach, but again, you have to think about this this is one data point in the whole picture. Now, if I had this picture, I would say that this was probably going to be less likely because my left atrial filling pressure, usually in left ventricular cardiogenic shock, you're going to have elevated left atrial filling pressure. So this is probably unlikely. And you're assuming that I already calculated cardiac output and it's low as well. So if this is unlikely, um, I crossed that out. Again, I didn't give any history about fevers or anything like that or source. And so, and cardiac output is low, so I would say this is probably unlikely. Um, this could be possible, but again, I didn't give you any history about that. I have someone who's after dialysis. You don't know if they got UF or not, but there may be high likelihood that they had fluid removal, right? So he is in hypovolemic. Likely, I would say, if I saw this pattern, after dialysis, hypotensive, I'd be going to this picture if I saw this picture, this EDA pattern. So hypovolemic shock, and I would give fluids. So pseudo-normalization is a concept. So if you have stage two diastolic dysfunction and your E is greater than A, you've already know that this person has impaired relaxation. Sometimes you can't tell as if it's a subtle case and you actually, let's say you didn't know if you had a diastolic dysfunction or not and you saw this. Is this normal or is this diastolic dysfunction? If you have them balsalva, if you give them nitroglycerin, you diurese them and you got this pattern, that confirms that the patient has diastolic dysfunction. And this is called pseudo normalization. So, all right, so let's do the next case. 65, history of hypertension, coronary artery disease, chronic AFib on anticoagulation, CKD4. Presented to the outside hospital, right middle of pneumonia, received fluids and antibiotics. O2 demands continue to worsen, requiring intubation. Five days in the ICU is not requiring 100% FIF2 with A to P. P to F is low, uh, it's 120, so severe ARDS. Uh, unclear ins and out balance, weight is up 12 kgs, transit for a higher level of care, bedside lung ultrasound, echo or perform. So this is my other situation where I have elevated filling pressures. I, I have um, uh, hypoxia that I'm trying to evaluate. So I do my lung ultrasound, so 
and my left and my right. So there's significant B lines bilaterally, right? So I have a pulmonary a pulmonary edema patterned bilaterally. So now I'm trying to figure out is that cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Now I do an echo, so it looks like I have a personal lung. Look like uh, my left ventricular function is retained, right? So my walls are coming in nicely. And again, you want to make an assessment on multiple views, but let's say I have this. I looked at it short as well, and that EF is maintained. Um, uh, I have normal left ventricular uh, ejection fraction. All right. So if I go to the next case, my next image. I go on to do my mitral analysis. So my E. Uh, so if I do my mitral, um, my E prime is uh, five. So again, I have my uh, tissue developer set here at the left ventricle at the medial annulus, and it's five centimeters per second. So that's low. So remember the cutoff I use is less than eight. So I know I have impaired relaxation, and I'm doing my my E and A right. So I have my E wave, my A wave. So my E, I already know I have E impaired relaxation. My E is bigger than my A, and so I am at least stage two, maybe three. And so now my E to A ratio is not greater than two. But again, that's more helpful in someone with systolic dysfunction. But I already have diastolic dysfunction. So if this is greater than two, my pretest would be high likely saying that they have left elevated filling pressure. Next thing I can do is I can look to see what my E to E prime ratio is. Now, an E to E prime ratio, let's go back to the flow chart. I didn't really focus on this yet, but... So ED prime ratio is basically the ratio of your E wave, which is your peak mitral velocity using Doppler, uh, blood Doppler, and then your tissue Doppler, so your ratio. If the average is greater than 14, or else I use for the medial annulus greater than 14 as well, you can, I would just simplify and use the medial annulus, and that's what Dr. Paul Mayo does as well. And so if that ratio is greater than 14, you likely have elevated filling pressures. Now... I'm trying to figure out if this is a cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic, right? So if I have my E wave of 147, I have my E prime of 5.23, I know my ratio is greater than 14, right? So it's much, much higher than that. So I, I have elevated filling pressures. I do a TR evaluation and I see, um, so my TR velocity is greater than 2.8. So that's a second criteria already. So I already knew I had impaired relaxation from before where I knew I had TDI was low, and then this is the second criteria you can use for ejection for diastolic dysfunction if you're trying to see if someone has a normal EF and diastolic dysfunction. Now, um, so uh, I am assuming you guys have had a Doppler talk, and so I, I'm skipping over a lot of things, and these are complex things, but so forgive me, but um, this is your tricuspid valve regurgitation signal. So right ventricle, left ventricle, your jet right here, you have continuous wave Doppler, and this is your peak velocity of your tricuspid valve. Right? So it's much greater than 2.8. What kind of pulmonary edema is this? So likely cardiogenic, right? And so that's pretty much it, guys. So um, I hope that was helpful. Please email me if you have any questions. And these are my references. Thank you very much.